Well, it's certainly good to see everybody here this afternoon. I guess it is afternoon by about 30 seconds now. Um, and it's an extraordinary pleasure for me to introduce to you Sister Carla May Streeter. Um, and sort of talking to people, I realize she probably doesn't need an introduction to me. She's been part of the Hawaiian Institute for the better part of three decades. She came here in 1985. The school at that point was located in, uh, right, really right down the street here in New Hall. Um, uh, the school had relocated from Dubuque in 1981 to uh, St. Louis University, and Carla May joined the faculty in 1985, and she's been here since. Through ups and downs, highs and lows, uh, Carla May has actually been a constant on our faculty. Uh, I became Professor Emerita about 2000. Eight, nine, something like that. Even though she became Professor America, which meant you know she sort of got, gets to do whatever she wants, whenever she wants. She is at the school every single day, and there's always a troop of people coming in and out of her office. Uh, she continues, of course, to host this Abrahamic dialogue involving representatives of uh, Islam, of various uh, Christian communities as well as, of course, the Jewish community as they ponder both the differences and similarities between the three great uh, monotheistic faiths. So Colonel May is a, uh, she's a pillar of faith communities here in St. Louis. She's certainly a pillar of Aquinas Institute of Theology. Um, and for a woman who's supposed to be retired, she works harder than anybody I know. So Colonel May, welcome to Dialogues. It's all yours. I'm going to stay here so that I can uh, get close to you now and then. I hope you can hear me all right. Can you hear me? Is there anybody who has difficulty hearing me? Okay. Uh, what we're going to do today is just explore some things that maybe have been asked in the back of our own minds. You grew up being taught in your catechism what God is like. You've grown since then. So before I begin with what I want to share, I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody at that table, and I want you just to take a moment of reflection and say, what was my idea of God back when I was 10? What is my idea of God today? What happened? So just take a moment to recollect your thoughts and then turn to one other person and say, well, I think it was something like this. And try to put yourself in the experience of who God was for you when you first were introduced and what you've done with it since, okay? So turn to your neighbor and see what you can share. He's blessed among women. <laughs> Threat. Threat. <laughs> Okay, 
you draw your conversation to a close, All right, let's come back together. Finish off your conversation. Were you surprised? Were you surprised with what came out of your mouth, maybe? Were you surprised by what you heard the other person say? Did you laugh at what you said? And did you laugh, maybe, at what the other person said? Well, that's a good place to be in. Because if we can't laugh at the foolishness of some of the things that we thought when we were smaller, then we're rigid, we're too, we're too tight. We need to have the ability to laugh at the way our ideas need to grow. Because we know nothing about this mystery, whatever, really, if we're honest. And what I'd like to do this afternoon in this brief time is in two parts. I'd like to show you where we've been and what has happened. And I'd like to show you where we are and what that means as challenge for you, whether you come from the Catholic tradition or the Protestant tradition. Is there anybody from the Jewish tradition here? Muslim tradition? OK, just checking. But uh, to just be aware that you aren't finished yet by any means. If you think you have an adequate idea of will the real God please stand up, you're mistaken. So let's start on that common ground right off. I'd like to begin by telling you about next Saturday. Next Saturday at, in Jefferson County at the library, there's going to be a panel. There'll be three of us on the panel, and one is a, probably what we call a New Age gentleman. The other is a Protestant minister, and myself. Do you know what our topic is at the county library? Our topic is, does God exist? That's the topic. We have a whole group of people coming to hear what truth or nonsense we're going to say. Okay? So just to know, to let you know, this is not a dead question. This is not a question that, well, we, we talked about this at the cat, in the catechism stage. This is today's question because of quantum physics, folks. This is today's question because of the Hubble. This is today's question because of interplanetary exploration. This is today's question because this has to do with the Mars probe. That's our day. That's where we live today. But where did we live? Let me begin in the beginning. Let me begin at the time when human consciousness was coming to the point of self-reflection. That point in evolution when human consciousness is a boomerang. Now let me explain what I mean. When we're talking about human consciousness, dogs and cats are conscious. Plants, even some plants, are semi-conscious. You try and and try and touch a sensitive plant and watch what happens. But the consciousness is one way. I know you, you give me food. When you're around, I might have something to eat, a treat maybe. Fido doesn't sit down and say, my name is Fido, and I prefer chicken <laughs> to ham. No, no. Fido, as far as we know, doesn't do that, but you do. Because your consciousness is so constructed is that it self-reflects, it reverts back, and you can say, hmm, now I saw the data on my lab report, hmm. 
I have to ask the doctor about this. I don't understand this and this on my lab report. I better ask him about that. And then my wife and I are going to sit down and have a talk. If that's my lab report, then we got to have a talk. And then we might have to make a decision about where we're going to move. Now, if you haven't done that, somebody you know has done that. It's called self-reflective consciousness. You can, you can go back and forth, look at data, and go back and forth and, and work with that data. Because you have a human consciousness which is wide open at the top, like a, like a, a ceiling, you know, a stadium that has a retractable ceiling. When you look up, you don't see the ceiling. If in a retractable roof, you see the stars. The human consciousness is made for something beyond itself. And because that's true, if you want to know how you know that, take a little baby in your arms and make a funny face. Now, you've all done this. And watch that baby smile. The smile in a baby is your first introdu introduction to their spirituality. They are filled with wonder. They think you're the cutest little thing they ever saw, or the funniest thing they ever saw, because of that funny pair of glasses you have on your face. And if you're not careful, they'll rip them right off. They're not even three months old. They're already giving evidence of that wonder, which is the basis of, of our being spiritual beings, not just secular, material beings. We have a psychosomatic life, and we have a psycho-spiritual life. Well, in the early days, when this first came about, you had human creatures that could not distinguish between these powers of the water, powers of the air, powers of fire, and powers of the earth, they were scared to death of tidal waves. They were scared to death of a burning village. They were scared to death of a cyclone, and they were scared to death of an earthquake. You got it. That's God. That's God. And you better keep him happy. So you're going to offer him your son or daughter, because that's the best thing you have. It's called animism. Animism is the, is the identification of a power of nature with the divine. They didn't know any better. But you watch what cultural history shows you, and you get to about 500 BCE, and already those four powers of air, earth, water, and fire are personified. So you have Poseidon, the god of the ocean. You have Zeus in Greece. You have the, the god of the sky. You have, in South America, you've got Pachacama. The ruins in Peru are amazing. What is Pachacama? Earth Daddy. That's the ring of fire. That's where all the earthquakes take place. So you worship the power of shaking the earth. This is, this is cultural history. Personification is a step forward where now they're named. But you still have to keep them happy. And very often, that's a bloody deal. You at least offer them the victims of your battles. And Greece and Roman history is familiar with that. We come, of course, to Israel. But most of us don't know that probably Iran beat them. 
Around 500 BCE, there is what is called the axial shift. It's not a shift of the Earth. It's a shift of conscious awareness. You've got Socrates. You've got Aristotle, Plato, Confucius in, Jap in China, Shinto movements in Japan. You've got Hinduism and the Vedas in India. And yes, you have the prophets in Israel. But what we've missed is Persia. Persia. In Iran, which is ancient Persia, there was a so-called guru whose name was Zaranustra, or Zoroaster. The Persians and the Zoroastrians are possibly the first monotheists. They beat the Jews by a couple of years. How did they worship God? They worshiped God in the form of fire. And they very interestingly named God, or fire, the word of God. Fire was the word of God. Now there was a heretic in Persia whose name was Mani. He was a prince. And he taught a double god theory, the god of good and the god of evil. And the god of evil smashed the god of good into a thousand light shards, and they all fell to earth, and they all got encased in clay. And guess what those are? Those are human beings. This is the beginning of Manichaeism. Mani was so stubborn that when they arrested him for heresy and put him in jail, he wouldn't eat, so he starved himself to death. This is the basis of dualism. And interestingly enough, Mani's honoring of this double god theory, I can never remember the evil god's name who supposedly won this battle. But the name of the good god in Persia is Ahura Mazda. And if you think that might have some connection to the cars you've been driving around, you're probably correct. In Zoroastrian, Ahura Mazda is the god of light. This is the soup. This is what's going around about 500 BCE, 500 years before the coming of Christ. You've got all these major movements. And why are they not just animists anymore? They're not animists because they have discovered that if they carefully put their embers in their hearths in a pot or an enclosure, those embers won't get loose and burn down their hut. And if they build their villages on the sides of hills, they'll have protection against those huge windstorms. And if they listen to their animals, they might know when an earthquake is coming. And if they build the village on stilts, they'll have no problem when the tide comes in. What is this? It's the beginning of basic science. So they realized these powers that they had been worshiping, they could control by their science. That's when all of the religions began to be more formalized as we know them today. And the move took place. Now, I'm coming back to Israel. When you have a group of people, the Jews who are our ancestors, realizing that this mystery cannot be equated with the material world, you have that insight coming, of course, from the burning bush. Moses is very curious, comes, takes off his shoes, his sandals, because he's told he's on holy ground. Who should I say you are? The voice says, you just tell them I am. 
Now that sounds like just, you know, some kind of metaphysical statement. But it gives the first notion of a whole realm of being beyond material realm, the material realm. Now you have to understand that today, most people are living within what we would call a secular materialist worldview. That means if it can't be measured, if it can't be empirically observed, it ain't. I don't know what they do with their mother's love. I don't know what they do with things like truth or goodness or beauty that you can't always measure. But very often, that is the position that a lot of people have taken today. They live within what we would call a secular materialist boundary. Anything that is outside that boundary is up for question or suspicion. So what are we Christians to do? What is the basis for our belief system that we're going to look at in just a minute? What's our, what's our basis? Well, let me make a startling uh, admission to you. You can argue with me if you want. 99% of our lives, folks, are built on faith, not fact. You say you're out of your mind. Let me, let me just assure you I'm not. You got your lab report from the doctor. Did you believe it, or did you do the lab tests? Or do you believe your doctor? You come to the corner over here, Compton. You want the light to change because you want to cross the street. Do you believe the light is going to change? Or do you know exactly what's going on in that little silver box? Have you checked it out? You go shopping at Schnucks or Deerberg's, your preference. You want a can of Campbell's pork and beans. You look at the label, 700 milligrams of sodium. I don't know if I want to take that much. Hmm. Do you know there's 700 milligrams of sodium in there, or do you believe Campbell's? How much of your life have you really analyzed? Why are you so angry at Bernie Madoff? Because he lied to you. You can't be trusted. Because people gave him their money. And he made off with it. They had no other recourse. They had to trust the guy. And he betrayed them. So do our politicians, don't they? Maybe you have a bad plumber experience. Maybe somebody really didn't take care of that construction part of our new house. 99% of your life is built on natural faith. So you have to check out whether the people you deal with are credible. You do the same thing in religion. What is your credibility test religiously? Have you joined a new cult recently? What staying power do they have? Where have they gotten their religious information? Do you want to put your trust in them? Or do you want to belong to a coach that's going to really put you through discipline to help you to be holy? Well, then you had better choose your coach carefully, a coach that has staying power, even though he may flub up now and then, which everybody does. So do religions. You can name one. If you can name one that hasn't, I would like to know. Religions are groups of people 
living by a creed, code, and cult. CCC, creed, code, and cult. And that creed, code, and cult is a, is a disciplinary regimen that helps you to be holy, that helps you to continue your search for the divine. And so we have in the Judaic tradition the understanding that God's voice or this mysterious transcendence will come somehow through holy people called prophets. And they'll write it down on this skin, and then I'll be able to read it again and again. I'll be able to hear it read again and again, and that's the way I'll get the voice of God. Not bad. And something happens to the sacrifice, doesn't it? Can't offer sacrifice anymore. Temple is gone. Is that part of the plan? And then, lo and behold, we have a credible source that tells us that that mystery made a final step. And it was a kneeling down step. It was a bending down step. That that mystery said they're just not getting it. They're not listening to my prophets, my holy ones. Well, I guess I have to go in person. We are absolutely outlandish, we Christians. We are off the wall. Can you understand what we propose? It's scandalous, really, that this mystery that can't be comprehended in human terms should enclose himself to write not on dead skins, but on living DNA? That's a little too close for comfort. But that's exactly what we teach. That this mystery did not want to remain in what we call transcendence. Up until the Jews and up until Jesus, God's transcendence is really built up. God is other, unable to be grasped at. The one who is all existence, and all existence rests in God like a hazelnut in the palm of God's hand. That's Julian of Norwich. And this one, this one is going to ask a lovely lady if she'll please give him a body. Come now. There's got to be a better plan than that. That's reduction. And yet that's what we teach, that this mystery by Gabriel went to Mary and said, will you give him a body? And she said, now, I don't know how I'm going to do this because it's not the usual. And he said, never worry about that. God's going to take care of it. And then the angel held its breath. Was she going to say yes or not? And she said, uh, well, OK. And she signed a blank check. And God bent down, pulled himself in, condensed the majesty to the size of a man's fist. Now, you men here, if you look at your fist, that's the size of a woman's uterus. He 
this is preposterous. No wonder people don't believe us. That God, without losing a thing, could bring himself so small that he would live within her body for nine months and thought it was just marvelous to grow fingernails and hair follicles and eyeballs and little toes. And that's what we teach. That's who God is for us in this world where people are wondering whether God even exists. We are so outlandish. Not only does God bend down to do that, then he gets born, and then he gets into all sorts of trouble. So they finally arrest him and do him in and hang him on a tree, like a lynching tree, which should resonate with our American history. And he doesn't do a single thing to stop it. Not a single thing. And he's supposed to be the Lord of the universe? Oh, come now. Again, who would want to become a Christian? This is nonsense. This is no way for a God to act. Or is it? And then comes Holy Saturday, and then comes Good Friday night and Holy Saturday, and all the lights go out. They believed him. They put their faith in this teacher. Can you imagine Good Friday night? Go there and sit in that darkness. Sit next to the mother of God as she's in shock and wonders if she hallucinated did I hear wrong? You say, why did God do this? This is so dumb. We can live without this. Or can we? Is this our story? Is this what we have to know is going to happen to us? And how they hung on with their fingernails is the way we have to hang on at those dark times. And are we a bunch of fools? Are we just a bunch of idiots? Well, we sure would be if that was the end of the story. But it isn't the end of the story. He said something was going to happen, and it did. At least there are 500 witnesses or more. Now, somebody doesn't get out of the grave every day and say, ta-da. We have the same problem that our secular atheists and agnostics have. We have to decide whether this story is credible. That story is in our Gospels. That story has been handed down to us by 12 ignorant fishermen who should have faded into history and been gone. Well, they aren't. So where do you want to, how do you want to pay your insurance? What's credible? That's what faith is all about. The God given to us, and that takes us, you know, you, you, getting the story straight. I've got a little word road map here for you. Um, we've got the whole idea of transcendence. I want to stop before we turn the page over because I want to take us to today. But I'd like to have you just pause a minute. And I'd like to ask you a quite personal question. In your young adult life and not so young adult life, have you had your dark moments? Have you wondered 
if all your catechism is nothing but a bunch of hogwash? Go to that same person you were talking to and let them know a little bit about your dark times. Have you had your doubts and your questions? What you're able to express, talk about. What you'd rather not talk about, don't talk about. Okay, take a few minutes. Okay, taper off your conversation. Okay, and we are back together. If you turn now to the back page of your handout, the first side. Okay, on the back side of your front page, you have the notion of imminence. We're back together, everybody. On the back side, you have the notion of imminence. You've got two things going on here. In the first part of this history, up until the coming of Christ, you have it established very firmly that God is totally other, untouchable, way up there or way away there. With the incarnation, you're going to have a whole new direction take place, and it is, no, I'm not there. I'm right in your face. Are, is it either one or the other? No. It's both and. I am still other right in your face. The incarnation of the coming of the God-man in the womb of Mary, and then death dying there, and then having the humanness transformed, is the last part <coughs> of the story of this search from nature, which was the first scripture, to the point in which the human being is being shown to be the real temple. Therefore, the Jewish temple is gone. And mistakenly, 
they're waiting for an earthquake so that mosque, that mosque, mosque collapses and they can rebuild it. No. The new temple has already been rebuilt. The new temple is the resurrected body of the Christ. With a preview of coming attractions that so shall it be with you. Now, if you listen to tonight's news, it doesn't sound like we're on that track at all. Well, it didn't sound too good on Holy Saturday night either and on Good Friday night. It was a wash-up. There's no place for this story to go. It's a dead end. That's what everybody thought. But like some marvelous magician, God pulls a rabbit out of a hat where a rabbit shouldn't be. And what is the rabbit God is going to pull out of this political administration, Israel's right-wing political administration, the Syrian war, and what's going on in the Middle East? Feels like Good Saturday, Holy Saturday, Good Friday. Well, don't close your possibilities. You shouldn't have then, and you shouldn't now, because who you're dealing with has no end game until the plan is complete, and you're part of the plan. As we look at this new teaching, this new teaching is all that you've set up in the past, all your buildings, all of your fancy clothes, all of your rules and your order. All I'm doing a new thing. It's not really a kingdom. It's a kingdom. Take out the G. There's no class system. Who's my father? Who's my mother? Who's my brother? Who's my sister? He's turning it all upside down. Blood ties are not the most important anymore. You're my brother. She's your sister. She's got dark skin, but she still belongs to you. She's family. He's turning the whole thing upside down. The whole human family is one. They're all going to be together. Oh, and we're going to have a new Jerusalem, too. We're going to call it the new Zion, but that's all right. Who are you going to believe? The way you decide if you're going to believe your lab report. Is this stuff credible? Does this come with a pedigree? This is not, well, I'll believe a little bit. No. He says either you're in or out. Do you trust me? This is not childish stuff. This is where we are at with our understanding of God. This is what we are being challenged for as we move into Holy Week, as we relive it, as we begin to say, dear God, could I have gotten through this? You don't ask just that question. Ask what you have been through. You've been through your own passion, your own terrible disappointments, your own testing of your own faith. It's not that story. It's your story. So then we have to look at today. This is our challenge as believers who have been baptized into this mystery. But this week coming, we're going to be asked to ratify that baptism, which means we're going to sign on the dotted line again. Because we have a hope. We have a hope. And if he could do what he did, 
then. God, help us what he can might do today. In our context, we, we have to say, who is God and where is God? And God is no longer the little white guy with the long beard in, on the clouds looking down and saying, good luck. If that's the God your atheist friend doesn't believe in, you can join him. That's a caricature. We are being told today through quantum physics and through cosmological understanding that the atomic structure of which everything is made is really more space than solidity. That the basis of protons, neutrons, electrons is a little particle called the quark. Quark, Q-U-A-R-K, quark. And when you say, well, what's a quark? They're going to answer you, well, it's a little piece of light. You say, what? It's a little piece of light, a light beam or a light particle. Which is it, a particle or a beam? And they're going to say, it's what you want it to be. They're going to say, oh, come on now, that's not too, too scientific. But that's true. These particles that they're dealing with at a microscopic depth level in quantum physics are blowing their minds. A quark or a light particle will become a particle if you wish it to be. It will be a beam if you wish it to be, which means there's something to do with the magnetic force of your intentionality that can influence that quark. What else don't we know? Where's God? In some heaven light years away? The incarnation has taught us that God is between the particles. Do you ever wake up and wonder where God is? That's your problem. God's been there all the time. You are forgetting. What would happen if we would recover that reality? God is not some isolated being. God is personal, self-giving, incarnate love poured out until there's nothing left. That's what the cross teaches, and that's not the end. Because as part of the pouring out, he puts himself into the form of bread, in a bread box, to be accessible. He can't bend down any further. Furthermore, if you're made out of quarks, ladies and gentlemen, you're made out of light. And that will have no problem when you're transformed in your new physicality we call resurrection. Science is not opposed to us at all. Science is getting uncovered a lot of stuff that we have believed from mystics in the Middle Ages. This is the time where you live. Quantum physics is showing us for the first time the absolute nearness of God, who is existing in our midst, in the midst of all the social upheaval, in the midst of all the congressional sessions, in the midst of all of the Supreme Court negotiations, in the midst of all our family discussions, and God's presence there is like pulling, pulling, pulling us into our future. What's the next stage of evolution? What are we to be 20 years from now? 
What is the earth going to look like 20 years from now? What are they really going to do about this climate change business? Are we going to sit here and fiddle our thumbs, twiddle our thumbs? No. This God is not somebody saying, good luck down there. Figure something out, you guys. It's in the midst of our consciousness working, pulling us to possibility. God is so close, he's closer to you than your cheek. When you pray, when you pray, just stop and rest. You've been running. Stop and rest and just say, are you there? I'm here. Clunk. Practice that. It will help you with the move from the prayer of transcendence, the God out here, to the God of immanence, who is the God with you, Emmanuel. This is either true or it is off the wall, folks, what we believe about the mystery of the divine. It's off the wall. And yet this is what we teach. This is what helps a martyr go to death. This is what helps a woman get through childbirth. This is what helps you deal with a terminal disease. This because you're never alone. Never alone. And when you close your eyes in death, those arms will be there, and you'll wake up and see a face you've been longing to see. That's what we teach. And that heaven isn't someplace far away. Heaven is where God is. And guess where God is? So we are in a stage of not the loss of faith. We are regrouping our belief for the first time and realizing what we've been taught and what the ramifications of that means for a sense of presence and a sense of our presence as church and as people of God in this culture. That's who we are. We are the new temple. We are the new person of intimacy. We're God carriers. And I are certainly on dirt days we don't feel anything like that. But we know that's what we've been taught, and we just keep trying to believe it. Why did you come today? You came today because you were suspicious that you were right. And you are right. You wanted to see if I'd be so crazy as to tell you you were wrong. <laughs> now, we're going to close, but before we do that, you've been listening. Is there anything you want to ask, push button on? Let's take two or three questions, and then I'll hang around for a bit, and we can talk a bit more. But people have to go home. So anything that you want to ask? Father uh, Martin has the, the mic, and he might be able to take it to you so you're heard a little better. Anything that occurs to you that you want to push? Let me just make a comment of the last page in your packet. You are going to be hearing very, very much about Richard Rohr's new book, The Universal Christ. And I'm going to speak here as a Dominican. Uh, Richard Rohr is a brother Franciscan. Now, you have to understand that Franciscans are considered lunatic fringe. <laughs> All right? All right? And um, th that means, now, that means they go to the vanguard and they take all the flack and then everybody comes riding in on their shirt tails. 
they, they very often get all the fire. And at the same time that this is true, I'm going to say that Richard dances. Richard does theology like a dancer. He makes great big leaps. And so as a Dominican, I'm going to say, yes, you might get his book. So I gave you a copy of what's being advertised about his book. But when you, when you read his book, you have to know he's in the middle of a leap. He didn't tell you how he got there. You have to ask the Dominicans maybe how he got there, <laughs> all right? Because they're, they're going to try and tell you how he went from here to here. He's going to talk about here, OK? So that's just a comment on that sheet at the end of Because you're going to be asked, have you read that book yet, you know? Any question that somebody wants to ask before we close the session that you think would benefit other people? Please. I, it, the New Age movement is a hunger movement. It's, in my opinion, it's coming from uh, young people who have never been given any solid food. And they are, they are hungry because they have a sense of their own spirituality and they don't know how to feed it. So very, very often, they will go to a lot of the new, uh, new Age possibilities in which there's a lot of truth. Because, see, we follow hunches. And, and this exploration is very sincere on the part of people. What is needed is solid guidance. And they need to go to the religious traditions because they're wisdom traditions and see what they can pick up. They can't just jettison them. If they do, they're jettisoning centuries of tried wisdom and starting all from ground zero. You don't do that. If you're wise, you talk to people who have been experienced in this for a number of years. So to the New Age people, I would say keep the search on. Talk to reputable people. Get a good spiritual guide. Let them call you in and say, you better question that, dear. You're biting into something, and it, it is just on the, on the fringe. You've got no basis for that. You better check the science on that or whatever. You need a guide to really help you to be in touch with wisdom. Otherwise, you can just go off the deep end. OK? Yeah, please, sir. Thank you for confirming my suspicions. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the tension that creates, I think, in people and definitely in me is the words for the liturgy of the Eucharist especially um, seem to portray God a little different than this. Somebody's first name, you know, and a being separate from us, you know, that we address in different. It, it just doesn't seem to work, you know, the way we talk about God and the Eucharist, married, eternal life, you know, those kinds of things. So I guess I'm worried about the tension and how pastor would respond to the tension that the Eucharist actually itself, not in gesture so much, but in word. And don't they say something about the way he prays, the way I, how, how, do we, how do you do you see the tension I'm talking about? And yeah, I, I would say carefully. What do you do? You move carefully. Because you have to both honor the fact that they're, they're intention enough to ask the question and push on it and saying the language doesn't work anymore. But at the same time, you don't throw the baby out with the bath. Be very careful to be non-dualist. It's a simple answer to say, now this was all wrong, so now this is right. Don't do that. Be careful to say what has to be preserved there. But just like, just like these gorgeous water lilies, you don't want them to be like this. You have, they have to open. They aren't their full beauty until that openness takes place. These questions are searching 
for answers to very deep questions, honor the questions and the person questioning. Don't shut them down. But don't believe everything either. You know, it's not either or, it's both and, which means we go back to the gift of the Jesuits, and that you've got to discern the spirits. You've got to be discerning. You've got to use your consciousness and weigh things out and not just jump on bandwagons because you might fall off and you know, hit the ground. It, it is not, it's religion is not something to trifle with. It's to honor and respect. It's the deepest hunger of a person, more so even than sexual intimacy. Those, there's two intimacies, this intimacy, the vertical and the horizontal. They are both are interconnected. And notice advertising will try to get you on both. The most primary intimacy is the search for meaning in the divine, to, to get some idea of transcendence. And then, of course, that intimacy I need with another, another human. And it forms a cross, not mistakenly. <laughs>